It is uh, my pleasure to be here. I will admit to you that um, when I was asked to do this, I actually enjoy doing these kinds of things. Generally, I'm talking to people about data-driven marketing. Um, and then I saw this VUCA thing, and I said, oh my gosh, what did I sign up for? Because I've never heard of VUCA. So, uh, um, but as I read about it, it um, certainly uh, resonated quite a bit. So I thought what I'd do um, is take the next 30, 35 minutes or so and give you a little bit of my context on this subject, and then you know, open it up for some Q&A um, to the extent that, that folks have some. So, Maybe just starting a little bit with me, just because a lot of, a lot of what I'm going to share with you, my perspective on, on this ever-changing world, really is driven through my experience at Merkle. I, I've been employed at Merkle pretty much my whole life. Um, I, I grew up, actually, my, I was born here in College Park. My dad was at the University of Maryland when I was born um, and um, lived all over the East Coast. Grew up in sort of a, my dad was a medical sales guy, so grew up in sort of a kind of, you know, upper middle class family and uh, went to Shippensburg University out in central Pennsylvania. Got out of school, became a retail stockbroker. I'd started a landscape business when I was, uh, was in um, high school and, and college, ended up selling that business. And, one of my clients uh, always was telling me, you should be a broker, you should be a broker. So I said, all right, I'll be a broker. Um, and I went and did that. And, and that was sort of a revelation for me because what it allowed me to do is meet a lot of interesting business people. So as I met all these really interesting people, I quickly, as a young person in my very early 20s, said, I'd like to own a business. I'd like to, to be a business person. And um, one of my clients um, owned a little company um, here in Washington, D.C. called Merkle Computer Systems, which was a 20 three-person data processing company, mainly managing mailing lists for unions and associations and people like that in DC. Um, I spent a couple days with him trying to get, um, um, actually my firm, Butcher and Singer out of Philadelphia, to represent him in the sale of the business. And after spending a couple days, I, I shook his hand as I was leaving and I said, Harvey, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna buy your business. And he basically patted me on the head and said, good luck. Um, and uh, it took me 11 months um, to raise the money and 13 banks told me I was crazy and my family told me I was crazy and lots of people told me I was crazy and ultimately went on um, to acquire that business and became its 24th employee. And so with that as sort of a backdrop, part of, part of the reason that I tell you that is I've never, I didn't come up through, I don't have an MBA, I didn't come up through the management ranks. I mean, I landed as a CEO and have been a CEO my whole life. Um, and um, share you a little bit about the, the Merkle journey and story. Um, as was said, we are a tech-enabled, data-driven, what we call performance marketing agency. So we do use data, technology, and analytics to do highly targeted and measurable marketing. So I guarantee you, we have 150 databases sitting in our data center in Columbia, and I guarantee you every one of you are in them. And um, so what we do for companies like JP Morgan Chase and Geico and AT&T and Microsoft and people like that is we build databases of every household in the United States. We populate those databases generally on average with about 2,000 different dimensions, what kind of car you drive, where you grew up, where you live, how many kids you have, things like that. Um, and then we use predictive analytics, mostly regression, to create propensity models that you'll buy auto insurance or you'll you know, subscribe to DirecTV or whatever that might be. Um, and we do that in a highly targetable way, generally delivered through media channels, digital media channels today like search advertising and display advertising and, and video and things along those lines. So that's really the business that we've grown. And if you think about where we started as a as a mailing list management company, which basically today would be like making buggy whips, and where we are today as we are the largest independent performance marketing agency uh, in the United States today. And um, you know, think about even as in the revolution of digital media, four years ago we didn't have any relationship with Google as an example, and this year we'll do about $1.5 billion with Google. So in a sense of the competitive set that I had in 2000 doesn't even exist today. So I, the, the context that I'm giving you is, is that in some ways as I think about VUCA, I actually don't think we're in a unique time. My view is we're, we're always in these times. They may manifest themselves in different ways, um, but you know, when, when I got in, in business, there was all kinds of disruptive forms happening you know, 28 years ago. And um, do I think we're in sort of an accelerated time? Maybe we are. But, um, Certainly, as I look at our, our, our customers and, and the kinds of transformations that they're trying to go through, it, it is interesting for me because I, I, I'm obviously trying to manage Merkle through those transformations of being a modern, you know, helping our clients be modern advertisers and then, in, in fact, being a modern partner to those clients. Um, and the kind of work we do today, um, you know, I would say generally didn't even exist five years ago. So the ability to constantly change has become really important. 
I also ha am in a lucky position because I, I get to spend a lot of time with management teams of very large organizations. So I get to see how they make decisions and how they think about consumers and how they think about technology and how they think about digital and how they think about disruption. Um, Ten years ago, Blockbuster was our biggest customer. I watched their marketing department go from 605 employees to four. Okay, so talk about getting disrupted. I, I you know, I, it's happened all over the place. Um, Borders was one of our biggest clients, top five client at one point. Um, so, with from my vantage point, I think ultimately, sort of the trifecta of of managing through this really is rooted in some pretty simple things. For me, as a business person, I think about three things a lot. I think a lot about leadership. I think a lot about management. And I think a lot about culture. Now you may say to yourself, okay, that's kind of the soft stuff in business and it's really about coding and it's about our product offering and it's about the way we're going to distribute and it's about our commercial or business model. And in my view is, it's not really about those things. You get leadership right, you get management right, and you get culture right. All those things take care of themselves. But if you get those other things right, leadership, management, and culture don't take care of themselves over time. It's why right now 50% of the Fortune 500 has a 0% organic growth rate. How does that make any sense, right? We have a growing global economy. In theory, those are some of the greatest companies in the world, which would mean they should be able to take share from the little guy like me. But in reality, that's not what's happening. And that's not, the reason that's not happening is because they have bad products and service. In my view, the reason that's not happening is because they fundamentally can't get leadership management and culture right. So what I thought I would share a little bit is sort of my context on, on those three things. And I distinguish between, it's not a textbook definition, but I distinguish between leadership and management in very simple terms. Leadership is about one to many and management's one to one. So when I'm doing a company meeting like this with my company, I'm a leader. When I'm sitting with one of my, my team members talking about exactly what we're trying to get done, I'm a manager. So, and I think that in reality, as you come up through the management ranks, most people you know, become leaders later in their career because you can't even get there without strong management skills. But in many ways, those management skills start to become sort of the dominant skills in the, in the, in the relationship or in your development. And so from my vantage point, I think there's, you know, I, I think it's relatively simple. Actually, uh, Benioff from Salesforce had a great quote, and I'm gonna butcher it here a little bit. But basically it said, his view is his job is to see the future get there with his organization so when the client gets there, he can welcome them, quote unquote, at the door. So I think it's a, just a great context for what leadership's really about, which is, in my view, leadership's all about defining the future. What is it gonna look like? And in some ways, that sounds relatively easy because you say to yourself, okay, you're an experienced person and I can create this vision for our future. But in reality, I think there's two really big disruptive forces in that conversation especially if your dominant lens is management, and I'll get to that here in a moment. The two elements for me are two things, customers lie and markets lie. So go back to uh, most people in this room, well, uh, that I can see, a lot of you are too young to remember what I'm gonna say, but Lee Iacocca, who was the president of Chrysler when the minivan was created, which is arguably one of the greatest um, automotive success, certainly in the last 50 years, um, really said he was being interviewed one time and he talked about this idea of no customer ever came to him and said, I'm looking for a minivan, okay? They created something and then put it in the market to see what the consumer wants. I was talking to a gentleman that's in our industry the other day that runs a business, the CEO of a business that's about a billion dollars in revenue. It hit a billion dollars of revenue in our industry in the year 2000. They have 6,000 employees. Today, they are a billion dollars in revenue. So the way my mind works, I say to myself, that company, 6,000 people have come to work every day for 16 years trying to grow a business and they can't grow it. They haven't been able to grow it one dollar in 16 years. How's that possible? So I'm, I, this is a, a, a so, sort of pseudo competitor of ours. So I was talking to him about sort of what is your vision for the business? How do you think about the business? And one thing he said to us is you guys have been so successful in analytics. Now, he became the CEO three years ago. He said, so a lot of my board members are telling us we should study more about what Merkel's doing and we should look more like Merkel. So he says to me, first thing I did is I went out and met our, for our top 20 clients and basically asked them, would you like us to provide analytic services to you? And he said, all of them said no. So that's not what they want from us. And I thought to myself, 
Seriously, like, are you joking? Or is this like a real conversation that's happening? If I, if I went to our customers 20 years ago and asked them whether they want us to provide analytics, they would have said no too. Okay, so the problem is the clients that they have don't see them through that lens. And, and it's easy for a client to say, no, I don't really get that. Like, why I have a partner over here doing that. Why would I want you to do that? So without a compelling conviction, and what I see all too often is people do, in some ways, data can be your enemy because people will do this research and whatnot to suggest clients don't want that from us. And my view is you've got to be constantly testing that market, and you've got to be showing clients things that they've never seen before or helping them think about value in different terms. And in reality, that might sound really easy, but I, in practice, it's actually quite hard, especially if you're a really big company, because there's a lot of risk associated with that. There isn't a lot of risk with doing a survey to your clients who say, we don't want analytics. So they're, you know, it's easy for him to go back and tell his board, hey, I talked to the clients and they don't want us to do analytics. Um, be much harder to say, I talked to the clients, they don't want us to do analytics, so I'm gonna do it anyway, okay? But that, in fact, is probably what they need to do to be successful. Secondarily, my view is markets lie. Way too much hype in the markets really easy as a CEO to get caught up in the cloud or, you know, whatever, you know, I, you know, e-commerce back in the day and, you know, all of these things that create sort of these bubbles. And, and my view is, is that you can't, and especially at the intersection of the public markets or the intersections of investors. So I, I actually think in many ways, I, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs. I think capital is a commodity. So, and I meet a lot of people that tell me, you know, hey, you know, I've been at this for 15 years, I'm five million in revenue, and I say, why aren't you bigger? And they say, well, like, you know, I can't raise the money, and I just say, well, that's, that's ridiculous. So that's not your problem. Your problem is something else. But my view is, as you think about markets lying, the intersection of that commodity capital, though, with the people who control it, is meaningful to people's thinking. So I can't tell you how many times people told me, David, you're in a services business. So the multiples, the valuation multiples, EBITDA multiples of a service business, you know, might be generally in the six to kind of 10, 11, 12 kind of range. You should pivot your company into a software business because the multiples in the software business could be 20 or 30. And I'd say to myself, why? I don't know anything about the software business. Um, that's not the business I'm in. So if my whole view in life is to be able to tell my buddies that I sold Merkel at some 20x multiple because I built a SaaS software company, that'd be fine. But that's actually not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build a great pump company that the best talent in the industry is going to want to work for and be a market leader in whatever we as a management team choose to compete. And so to a large degree, I, I really think that the, the, these things, the, the intersection of these things are actually meaningfully complex in, in my very humble opinion. And so I think you have to have a strong view of what that future is gonna be. Otherwise, you get distracted through, through all these elements. And, and candidly, I, I, think that le I think that vision, I think, I think vision's hard and I think management's hard. But in reality, I think a lot of people, I think as you come up through the ranks, what I see in, in our employees and, and others is that you, you get such a dominant management lens, it's hard to transition yourself really into a leader lens because you haven't really learned those kinds of skills, but you have experience and credibility, and, but you don't have the vulnerability to start to say, this isn't really, really where I am. So that's something that I, I see a lot. On the management front, I think actually management is about getting things done. So I think the idea of figuring out how to get things done, I actually think most companies are actually better at management than they are at leadership. Most people are better at management than better at leadership, with one, with one exception. I think most companies, including ours at times, are completely delusional about the facts at hand. So Jack Welsh, uh, was CEO of G for a long time, talked about the brutal truths. So he talked about this idea of seeing reality for what it is, address the brutal truths. And I, I see that every day. I see people that just wanna, they wanna walk away from the brutal truth. They don't really wanna see reality for what it is. They wanna see a reality that makes them feel better about themselves, better about their performance, better about what might happen tomorrow. And the truth is, none of that ever works. So, you know, from, from my observation, sort of seeing reality for what it is inside that management system and rhythm of that system and all those things becomes a, a really, really important element. Doing great project management or having great KPIs or, you know, understanding the breadth of that management system is one thing. But 
being able to operate that management system in a way all the way down into the organization, especially for a very large company that might have you know, hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of employees, very, very difficult thing to execute on. Back to you know, the combination of those two things. And then lastly, I'll talk for a moment about culture. Because I think, I think it was Drucker who said, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that. I think my, my experience is culture is our competitive advantage. Our competitive advantage isn't that we have 500 data scientists and you know, that we have world-class clients and we have all this experience. We have 500 data sciences. We have this world-class experience because of our culture. So you, you can't build a business and then decide what the culture is going to be. And I actually think culture is the CEO's job. So I think it starts, in, in my view, culture is a lot like a brand. Culture is an outcome of something. So at Merkle, we think a lot about the things that drive culture. So my view is beliefs drive behaviors, and behaviors drive outcomes, and outcomes equals culture. So we back all the way up to say, what do we believe in? Because if we can really define what we believe in, then what we find is people tend to, well, they tend to do one or two things, and, and this is something also as companies get bigger, they, they tend to sort of neutralize some of these things. I like a polarizing culture. So if, a, if, a, if an employee was thinking about joining Merkle, within about 15 minutes, I would prefer two very specific reactions. I can't wait to get out of here, or I love this place. What I don't want is anything in the middle. So I don't want a neutral culture. I want a polarizing culture. I want people to either very rapidly feel like they belong, and generally the reason you get that belief is because you agree with things. So when people are describing things to you, generally in my view, what you, the way you end up creating connections is because you agree. If you go through a series of beliefs and you don't agree with this and you don't agree with this and you don't agree with this, you don't feel like you belong. And then my view is, look, there's a lot of 13 million businesses in America. We only need 3,400 people to choose Merkel. So, you know, we don't need everybody to choose Merkel. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what that belief system is going to look like. I'll give you one example. Principles over rules. So we don't like rules at Merkel. So we don't like the idea that, you know, somebody, you know, our, our view is the 99.9% .9 of people that work for Merkel are generally going to make a good decision, and for the 0.1% of people that are going to screw it up, we're not going to make it harder for the other 99%. So we're going to treat people like adults, and we're going to let them do their thing. So it really helps us guide how we make decisions about policy and bureaucracy as we're, as we're becoming a bigger company. I think about it, someday I, I, I wrote a book on CRM, I'd like to write a book, and the title of my book someday might be, might be um, speed, I'm, I'm sorry, guardrails, not speed bumps. Okay, so when we think about rules, we think of them in that context, which is I want to create a set of rules that are guardrails that is going to save the company from killing itself versus speed bumps which are meant to slow us down. So it's just, it's part of our belief system. And we have a number of these beliefs. We have sort of seven core beliefs that we, that we talk a lot about. So I think that as, as, as sort of soft as that might sound, as I watch cultures of these other, in some cases, I just spent some time at Google as an example, I think they have a really interesting world-class culture. You may agree with it or like it or not like it, but the way that it's been defined and how early it was defined is, is present everywhere in the way they make decisions and everything else. So I think trying to get that right and then, you know, candidly, part of the challenge is every new CEO actually has a massive influence on the culture because you can't help as the CEO other than to inject your belief system into that management system. And the second you did that, you're changing the culture. So the idea somehow that culture is this thing, you know, you read a lot about Hewlett Packard and some of the problems they went through and this idea of trying to respect the culture that, that Hewlett and Packard, that they originally built, it's insane in my opinion. The second they're gone, that culture is gone because there's just no other way to do it unless you found somebody that was 100% aligned to the belief system that was there. So as I think about that, in, in terms of trying to get those things right in uncertain times, those are the things that actually make uncertain times relatively easy. You're seeing reality for what it is. You're constantly questioning what tomorrow's going to look like. It doesn't really matter what happened yesterday. 
and you're building a culture where that's permeating through the company so that the company's not waiting for David Williams or the CEO or our chief strategy officer to make some decision about what customers like, you know, what they'll find valuable 12 months from now. It's the whole company's job to do that. We've been through four major pivots at Merkle. So we've, we've, I remember all of them vividly, and I remember the fear of all of them, because in reality, for me, every pivot we made was a new line of business that I knew nothing about. And I remember, I remember the digital pivot. It happened to me in 2009, and I remember driving home in my car thinking to myself, am I really up to this? Like, am I really up to the energy and effort it's going to take for me to get smart enough to lead this company. I won't be the only one, and I'm not gonna be the smartest one on the topic, but I gotta know enough to decide. I gotta know enough to break the ties. And you know, there's a lot of energy associated with that. So I think, I think recognizing those pivots is sort of at the intersection of the three of them. I, I actually, right now, believe that we are literally in the last 30 days, I'm just starting to see the very early signs of our fifth pivot. It's just starting to come. Our fourth pivot started in 2009. So I think it, that is part of my job. Part of my job is to understand what's happening in that marketplace and how clients are receiving those things and whatnot. So I don't know if that's exactly the construct that you might have been expecting, but I, I, I firmly in all of my heart believe that what makes great companies and long-lasting companies, you know, the idea that the competitive set we had in 2000 is, is irrelevant and gone, um, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the Merkle that we've created and its ability to continue to evolve. I have a lot of confidence in it. I don't have a, I'm scared to death that we're going global right now, so don't get me wrong. There's lots of things about the business that make me nervous, but that's actually not one of them. And I think if you can find that strength, and it's, whether you're the CEO or you're a contributor to that system, I think understanding the dynamic and having awareness of how those things actually interact make you super, super valuable to that organization. So. That's my context on, uh, on an ever-changing world. Thank you. So thank you so much, David. We have a little bit of time for Q&A if any of you have questions like, what's the fifth pivot? <laughs> Go ahead. I think, advertising, I think advertising will continue to sort of bifurcate. So I think the world of advertising, I think of the world of advertising in two dimensions, marketing to known people and marketing to unknown people in the very simplest of terms. Branding is about marketing to unknown people. So most marketing, especially advertising, over the last 50 years has been marketing to a persona of a person. I, you know, my customer is 35 <coughs> to 45 year old, drives a blue Ford Taurus and has 2.3 kids. That's who I'm trying to find. I go to you know, this XYZ television show because that's the profile of that show and that's who I market to. I think branding's really important, but in reality, the way brands were built over the last 50 years, the way Coors built their brand, or the way Gillette built their brand, I don't think you'll ever see that happen again. I think you look at Gillette's a good example. Dollar Shave Club and the way that brand's being built, that's how every brand's gonna be built in the future, in my opinion. So what will drive that is marketing to a known set of individuals so that I can actually know um, I can know in a TV commercial exactly who's watching that commercial. In a search ad, I can know this stuff already, guys. So I, well, you're searching for something. I can actually know who you are. I can, I can serve a display ad to an individual mobile device. So we can, you log into somebody's website, even without authenticating yourself, we can know who you are. So what will happen is that marketing will still have a branding context of putting out a universal message that defines sort of the presence of the brand. But I think marketing of tomorrow will happen to an orchestration of events that you will not know as a consumer, but in my view, find much more valuable and relevant because it's really being driven about you. I think the marketing department of creativity and lots of things up on the wall is gonna look more like a Wall Street trading for within a decade. And I think both will ultimately exist to be successful. Me too. I think, it's, I think ethical behavior is, is, is a core value. 
So like who wants to do business with a company that doesn't have an ethical foundation? So I'll tell you right now, a consumer company couldn't last 60 days in America today without an ethical foundation. It just couldn't happen. Yes, I do. Okay, well, <laughs> let's uh, spread around the question. So, Ritu? Um, you spoke about speed bumps, and I wonder if you can comment on the new speed bumps that is uh, being on the paper today, that I'm going to continue with, and I guess the broader question is, in a way, do you see the tension between increasing privacy and privacy? Yeah, so if, if I said to you, I, I think this is a very complicated subject um, and for one very basic reason, which is it's very hard as consumers to understand the value exchange of me providing a piece of information to a company, right? My, my general or, I mean, I meet people, look, the truth is for me, I could care less. I don't care if people track me. I don't care if people watch me. I, I, don't, I, don't, have any, I don't have anything to hide is sort of the way that I view it. I'm not, you know, fine. You can you make, make my life more relevant, make my life better. That's going to be good for me. Without tracking, Uber couldn't exist, okay? So my point, though, is if, if I said to this room, hey, you know what, here's a good idea. Why don't we ask every, all of our banks and all of all, everybody that we do business with to every day send in whether you ever bounced a check or whether you pay your bills on time and all those kinds of things. There'd be an outcry. Think people are worried about a display ad. Well, that's called a credit bureau. Without a credit bureau, we've created a credit system in America that's unmatched anywhere in the world which has created a massive economic opportunity for consumers in America, yet today, try to go get a credit world built in a public environment. It would be very difficult. So I think there's this challenge with exchange, and what I generally observe is clients don't want to waste money. They want advertising to be more relevant, and I think that it's a subtle thing, so whether you see an ad that you care about or see an ad that you don't care about, hmm, I don't know, is that really going to change your life? But when you see an experience like Uber that you care about, it does start to have more influence. Good afternoon. My name is Beatrice Wynn. I am in the executive MBA. I'm a student. And you talk about, a lot about culture. And you mentioned that you are going global. And so I am curious to, to hear about, like, what are you doing and what is your plan to make sure that culture, um, your company's culture, is pretty much shared uh, when in different countries? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. We've actually thought a lot about it. The thing I like about a belief-driven culture is I can't imagine why our belief system would be different in different countries. So for us, not to, not to if you walk into a Merkel office in China or you walk into a Merkel office in Barcelona or London or New York or San Francisco for that matter, it's a different experience. So we're not looking for an undifferentiated experience. We're not looking to homogenize the world. We, we love diversity. And diversity lives in all forms, geographic being one of them. But what we found is beliefs carry the globe. And in reality, if I went into a market that was somehow misaligned to our belief system, now I could argue there are markets in the world like that, we're just not going to those markets. That's not a, that's not a place we want to do business. My name is Osei Yadam. I'm a first year student in the part-time MBA program. Um, you mentioned that you didn't take the advice to pivot into becoming a software company because you knew nothing about the business. However, with some of the other pivots that you've made, you also didn't know anything about the business, but I'm sure you learned about it along the way. Can you talk about how you managed those and decided which pivots to make and what is that fifth pivot? Yeah, the distinction for me is that the advice I've gotten to become a software company is all about our shareholder success. And I don't think shareholder success is an input. I think shareholder success is an outcome. I want to build a great company and that company is going to be valuable to our shareholders, period. I don't want to play games because SaaS is in vogue and, you know, the PE guys love it or something. That's just not, it's not a game we want to play. So it wasn't really in the sense of pivoting to be software. It's this is the company we want to build and it's going to be worth whatever it's going to be worth. And my view is be a great company and lots of good things are going to happen to you. Thank yes. you. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, Quick two questions. What keeps you up at night? And what makes you get up with a spring in your step? I'm sorry, say the second question, please. What makes you get up with a spring in your step? Mm, that's a good question. One, I sleep like a baby. I don't know why, but I do. <laughs> that's the honest truth. It drives my wife crazy. Um, you know, I, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So I, I don't really, I'm, I'm always, I've always thought about it like creative tension. So I always feel tension ever since I was, 
ever since the day I bought the business. I think attention like stretching a rubber band. Sometimes my attention is like really stretched and sometimes it's somewhat stressed. Right now we're going global and we're, we're doubling down on global. And you know, that puts me on the road and I'm in cultures that I don't understand and things, so my, my tension is high there. Um, and I, I'll be candid. I mean, I, I've been doing the same job for 28 years and I love our company and I love being a CEO and I love the business we're in. I love the people and all those things. But there's many nights when I go to bed, I'm pretty defeated where I'm thinking to myself, can we really do it? Is it really, you know, are we really there? Are we really being honest with ourselves? So on and so forth. And I think, I think that reflection is part of what creates the tension. The difference for me is it's never, I've never felt defeated in the morning. It's just never happened to me. So that's where I get my energy because I wake up every day and I say, oh, it's like a new day, let's go at it. And that night I'm probably exhausted and defeated, but the next day I tend to be energized again. So it, it's kind of a cycle for me. Hello. Yes. Oh, I have the microphone. I'll give it to you after. We're here. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan Katz. I'm a Maryland alumni and healthcare professional. And I'm curious if you have any advice for people who want to bring that energy into their leadership environment, but also need to balance the ambiguity and complexity of their personal lives. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think, I think learning, first of all, I think you have to learn to be a leader. And I think there's a lot of self-reflection and, and honesty that needs to take place in that. I actually don't find... You know, there's a lot of talk where all, we all talk about kind of work-life balance. And, you know, I, for me, I'm just looking for life balance. I don't really know what work-life balance is. But, um, and life balance is the way I want to spend my time. And if I'm spending time the way I want to spend my time, then I'm in balance. And if I don't, then I'm not, a, not in balance. Um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't, so I don't really see a lot of conflict in those things. I think in some ways it's a little bit about, like, you know, I, I, have, I have children now. I have five children. And I, I have children that are just entering the workforce. And part of my counsel to them is, is, is two-dimensional, one of which is pick the right industry. Okay, being in a lousy industry is a terrible thing. So pick the right industry because it's growing. Um, pick the right company, which is all about culture, and then don't worry about the role. Okay, but once you get in that environment, you have to start building, my view is, whether you want to be a CEO or not, I'd start building my CEO perspective my first day at work as a 21-year-old. And you have to take it upon yourself to be sort of the CEO of your career to be saying, what do I stand for? Not what my company stands for or what my professor stands for. What do I stand for? What do I believe in? And I, I mean, I think that there's, and then generally, just a, I think there's four kinds of people. I think there's generally people that have an inventor context, an investor context, an operator context, or an organizer context. And I think that quadrant has a massive influence on, on how, you, how that manifests itself through your career. Okay, yes. uh, my name is Rafa Abdallah. Currently, I'm going to the executive uh, MBA. Um, I'm just interested to see who is your customer in the federal space? Who is our customer in the federal space? In the digital if, space? Federal. In the federal, federal space. We don't do any business in the federal space. At all? Nope. I, is there is any interest? There is uh, maybe. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Do you have an opportunity? Yes. <laughs> um, are you going to tell us what the fifth pivot is? Um, yeah, well, I can, what I can share, I guess I'll give you, I'll give you a preview of it. I, I think that the amount, I think the disruption of what I described in marketing to a known individual consumer is disrupting many businesses that have an intermediary between them and the consumer. So think about, think about General Motors. They sell through dealers. So they don't really know who you are as an individual. Procter & Gamble sells through a grocer. I don't think there's a company out there right now is isn't trying to figure out how to be more direct to consumer. The second company really becomes direct to consumer. Our primary customer is no, more, no longer the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. It generally turns into the CEO. And we just aren't told to handle that. And it's becoming, we've fought this a little bit, but it's, you know, because now all of a sudden I'm competing more against McKinsey and Accenture than I am against, you know, Omnicom and, you know, WPP or something. So that's a little bit of the, I can see it happening. And the truth is we're not told right now to, we're not told to live in that world. Hi, can you tell me how you manage innovation? You have a lot of uh, people that are like-minded, you have a strong culture, but uh, does it lead to group thinking, um, uh, in your opinion, and, and apparently not? 
And yeah. Can you tell us how to manage ideas? Yeah, it's a really good question. So actually, I will tell you, I don't know that we figured out. We, we never had like a chief innovation officer or anything. We never had an R&D budget. So the way we've run the business was service lines who owned value proposition, and we judged them through organic growth rates, generally two to three times the market, which means you've got to take share to be successful. If you could do that, you could do it. And if you couldn't do it, we'd try to find somebody who could. Um, but in, in all candor, as we've gotten larger, we're now starting to, to create centralized innovation capabilities. I actually think we need a much stronger business process around innovation. I think we're sort of losing control of it, which means that actually it's slowing for us. Um, so to be candid, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an evol, it's an evolution for us, and I actually don't think we're, I don't really, I don't think we're really that good at it right now. I think we've been good at it at times, but that's part of that creative tension for me right now. Yeah, I think for me it's really simple. It really comes back to these, you know, if, if, if Merkel, I, I am always talking about two things that I care deeply about. I want to be a great company and I want to be a market leader. And I've talked about those things for 28 years and the truth is, it, I'm not saying that because I'm the CEO and it's my job. So, you know, I tell people at Merkel, like, you know, first of all, all CEOs get up and stand in front of their companies and say, we're going to do all these great things and you know, show these charts, we're going to get everything to the upper right. And, and then, you know, it's flatlined. And it's like, you know, so, like, when's the last time you heard a CEO say, well, we're going to be average and I don't want to try too hard and you guys should all take it easy. And, you know, so, but, <laughs> yeah. but from my vantage point, I do truly believe deeply in those two things. I, I will judge my life's work through those two lenses. And the people that will judge me isn't me, it's, it's our employees and it's our clients. And my responsibility, if I don't pivot right, we can't hire people, we can't promote people, we can't pay them more so they can send their kids to great programs like this. Um, and if I don't pivot, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna meet the mission. I have clients that have been with us for 25 years and I'm, I'm no longer gonna be the partner of choice and it's gonna be disruptive and it's gonna be bad and, and I don't wanna be in that situation. You know, we've uh, heard about the fifth generation stealth fighter, so you've got the fifth generation stealth pivot, I guess. There we go. Thank but you. I want to thank you so much for being here, giving us some um, great pointers on leadership, even some career advice, and a lot about your industry as well. And here's a little token of our appreciation. Wonderful. Thank so you so thanks. much.